much room for debate since your labyrinth was a cubicle with an open door. In terms of this metaphor, of course, you pour falling meteor, or of course, intended to plummet evermore throughout the cosmos, except your path brought you dangerously close to the burning mass. Of Ooh. That is some fucking deep shit. Hell yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, now the moment you've all been waiting for. Hey, you're great. You sound great. Awesome. Technical difficulties. What's up, fellas? Let's Woo! go. What's up? So joining us now, he's a fucking legend in the art world, also in the music world, co-founder of Anticon, yes, and somebody sir. that we've looked up to for a long time. Give it up for the one and only Dose One. Hell yeah. Woo! Thank you, fellas. It's great hey. to meet you all. Hey, Most thank definitely. you so much for joining us, taking time out of your Friday. We really appreciate it. Uh, Pleasure. Been looking forward to this conversation all week and uh, really, really excited about it. So let's let's dive in. Dose, let's hey, do it. Dose, where are you based out of these days? Uh, I don't know. Depends. No, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, I moved here to uh, be a part of Meow Wolf, which was kind of a nightmare. Uh, but I bought a house, and I love my house. So I got my cats. I got a nice lady, a motherfucking hot tub, a studio. Uh, you know, what, I, what, what, what do you need? Fuck it. Yeah, live a life. Sounds, sounds yeah. Sounds wonderful to me. I know you're a cat guy. How many cats do you have, man? Eleven. I, I wish I have two cats. I think more than two is a lot. Uh, one of them's sick, but they're dumpster cats. I've been rescuing cats since oh, I that's was like good. That's eight years old. That's a good thing. That's to awesome. Do. That's, that's always bad. nice. Yeah. I, sometimes you get you, also you get more animals, and some of them are losing attention because they're so needy as it is. You know what I mean? So it's kind of yep. unfair to them. Yeah, they're enough. One of them has like uh, is in renal failure, so she's like constantly needing meat and water oh, it's a whole thing i oh, love it yeah you got yeah it's like kids that's why I, that's why i'm not breeding because <laughs> i got this needy cat you know no you need go. to no need to let's uh talk, that's right let's talk a little bit about the music journey that you've been on because it has been quite a run talk about longevity uh somebody that's been making music since the 90s you started out battle <laughs> rapping a lot of the stuff that i learned about you was from scribble jam shit right uh Talk a little bit about that and the art of freestyling because I know it's something really close to your heart that you've you've you, the, the art of actually freestyling off of the top improv. On yeah, the spot, something that you, yeah, that, you've held close to yourself. Uh, that was like so. Uh, my arc start so I was dose one when I was a tagger and like a little shitty, even shittier person hoodlum and uh, so I think at like fifteen I was tagging dose and then I started rapping at sixteen. And it was all freestyle. And it, I sort of everybody freestyled. I missed this a little after that. It's not really that when I started, but a little after that, you could just walk down the street and it was like Mary Poppins of hip hop. There'd be like dudes ciphering and you could like hop in. Philly was pretty authentic. Uh, hip hop was real thanks to the roots. Um, we used to sneak into the truck and see the roots when I was a kid. And uh, everybody in Philly, you'd be at a party and everyone would lie about being in organics and being in the roots. You'd meet some dude and he'd be, he'd be like, yeah, I'm in the roots. And he'd be like, are you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> <So>. are you? <laughs> and then, uh, so anyway, I was freestyling and then I was in Jersey in a battle crew called Skill Scavengers. We would just serve everybody. And so it was like aggressive freestyling, just sort of eating people's faces. And then around that era, everybody started coming with these like amazing writtens and every single cipher would go at some, some, uh lesser person would like devolve it into written you know and sound uh, perfect and so i only started writing raps so i could have something to compete with the like chads that dropped <laughs> written and then uh a couple years after that i got moved to cincinnati uh and i was like my fucking rap career is over yo and then i met jay rawls cuz so when i got to cincinnati the only Nobody really rapped, and so I would crash all the black frats and just, like, see if someone was ciphering, and I would just cipher rat. And then I met everybody, and then I met this dude, T, and he introduced me to J. Rawls, and we met in the business college. And then we went to his house, recorded on a four-track ASR-10, and that was the first time I ever recorded or was like, I'm writing a thing that's going to be recorded, and we did a bunch of songs, and then after that I met Jell, and Scribble was right around there when I met Dibs. And uh, Scribble was cool. Uh, you know, like, I did, I battled. There was that Scribble. The first one in 97 was Super Righteous. It was me versus 
the heavy hitter source dudes, Rhymefest and Juice, and then the me and Eminem were ripping people up. But all oh, Eminem shit was written. That one was very climactic. But then the one where I battled peace after that, I was like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Because if the highest echelon of battling is pretending to disrespect uh, the rappers that formed me, it's not going to work. Yeah. You know, How it felt you- super phony. I saw that. I'm genuine. Yeah, I saw, I saw the same thing with uh, when Idea battled Peace. He he yep. kind of had that same – you saw him kind of hold back and was like, oh, this is somebody I've looked up to my whole life, and how can I just disrespect him like you said? Yeah. It's just – I don't know. I want to kill everyone, but not yeah. them, not my idols, not yeah. the guys that, like, put it in me. You know, like, uh, it was like, I think – uh you know and then also i got more creative at the same time like this whole time freestyling and battling and being unprepared was my art and then i started to write and i was like oh shit this is a whole other fucking art Mm -hmm. that freestyling barely plays into um you know and then after that i started collaborating making full lengths and that became this other layer so you know but battling was the best man i used to be uh a dick. I would serve fucking everybody, yeah. uh, anybody that needed it, and I still feel that way. There's a lot of rappers that I just see. You know, it's the same principle of like you could you meet someone, you could tell they've never been punched in the face. You can how, tell when a rapper has never been served. How do you, how do you <laughs> feel about yeah. the whole scene turning towards writtens? I mean, I don't like personally. I don't oh, like it, and, and it yeah. kind of upsets me to think because I like to freestyle, and I don't like to think that someone's coming somewhere prepared, studied did their homework and written down a bunch of shit because who knows if they can go the long distance. So that kind of always yeah. irks me. So how do you feel about that nowadays? Cause that, everything's written. Yeah. That's all it is now. It's, right? That's all it is. Yeah. It's sort of like, a. there is a tier, you know, that is serving someone. Uh, the composed tier is amazing, but the real t- width of the rapper, it, a lot of people can do that composed tier. Very few people can serve you on sure. on fucking spec. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And know nothing about you because you need it and they know how to do it, pull it out of the air. Uh I will say though, uh the some of the amazing execution over the years, uh, you know, rest in peace, Caddy Ron and Daylight and all these other Past fucking day. people. They like uh they destroy it. Some of that wordplay is fucking remarkable and those those dudes aren't really writing songs, so that's where you're going to hear that rap. So like when I hear that shit, I'm like, oh, that's inspiring rap. It makes me want to get a pen. So the gun shit, I don't give a fuck about. It's all fiction, you know, yeah. but when they're drilling it uh I love seeing somebody get dug into a hole and when the written dudes are digging people into holes, it's a worse hole. It's like yeah. bad. You know, that said though, what you were saying is my least favorite aspect where it's like someone tells me I'm going to battle someone and I got like five months to like research them uh, and love them yeah. and like serve them out of research and affection. It's a little weird. Yeah. It's not my bag, yeah, you know, yeah. but it has made for some entertaining oh, battles yeah. and made it to where you, yes. we got to see, you know, I've always said like in the freestyle battles at scribble, it wasn't always the two best at the very, in the final because Maybe no. the two best battled in the semifinal. You know what I mean? You didn't get to see the two best. We would get to see the two best at their best with these written battles, which was always fun and exciting. Good for numbers. And it's important to say, like, uh, on the East Coast, we definitely uh, – we had our own version. Like, in my crew uh, when I was younger, nobody listened except me to Fellowship was aware that people were, like, coming completely off top all the time and, like, killing it you know and i hadn't i wasn't even tape trading at the time when i started freestyling and battling well you know um so i wasn't even aware of how good all of project blowed really was or anything but so we had our own code about coming off top but getting exposed to that shit gradually um it just it was interesting how like i just knew that somewhere in the world someone was that good and I got exponentially better every time I rapped because I was just mentally in a room with a fictional version of these yeah. people I just heard on a crusty ass tape, you know, because here and that they would just like pull chains off, getting loose, pulling shit further and further away, rhyming faster, saying weirder shit. Uh, and not everybody around me was hip with that, man. I was definitely the weird one. And I would always have to say I was Puerto Rican, so I didn't get fucking jumped because we were <laughs> was, hard, being white hard. wasn't really the move. Yeah, I Puerto that. Rican, baby. 
Uh, so you, you said something about tape trading. That was a big thing in the 90s, especially towards the late 90s. Uh, and that was a way that a lot of people we've, we've talked about, uh, you know, people, underground artists putting their stuff on the B side of a tape that had rock. like, uh, yep. you know, Eminem on and one side or, you know, Dr. Dre on one side and getting that tape out on the, were you a big tape trader and did you put your, yeah, tapes on tapes? I got a couple good stories. I like, well, so all of Anticon is, uh, because of tape trading. Yeah. Huh? So we met, uh, I met Dibs of course in the town in Cincinnati. Uh, we became besties very rapidly and he had gel and we made pressage together but the whole time. He's like, you're going to love gel. Gel has Kevin Beecham, who you may know from, uh, he's in Minneapolis now down with rhyme sayers. Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, still is and always has been like a magnet and magnate for all things rap so he had all these tapes so he sends shit with jeff he's like oh shit dose i heard hemispheres you got to bring him atmosphere so i get overcast for the first time on tape and i'm blown away god's bathroom floor hard, and uh super hard. it's the monsters that i conjure and the marijuana yeah. and cat litter yeah. so that on and on and i like on. hear all that and i'm like oh man i want to be this guy you know and then at the same time i had the live poets 12 inch but then i got more tapes through dibs who played a show with the live poets which was soul and alias rest in peace and uh and mayonnaise mood swing and then that all just kind of like happened but that was literally all through tape trading and being interested and then pedestrian in anticon i lived with y and i was constantly sending stuff to pedestrian and he was sending stuff to me and i had weird east coast shit that was lost or that i dubbed or stole out of studios Mm. and he sent me all the blowed and more importantly because i had heard a bunch of that um i had all the saphir i had what was available the casual battle um but what I didn't have was circus and radio inactive mm. um, and the shapeshifters Shapes. and the, cir- uh, the circus and radio tapes changed my life, man. Uh, I definitely was like, yo, I got to, they were just letting it all out. Like, you know, and so was my music at times diuretic or whatever, but I was just like, yo, circus doesn't give a fuck. Radio doesn't give a fuck. Radio styling circus always just like, um, the origami and the, just like, his, off, just off some other shit dude yeah really yeah. inspiring yeah. um so and then through tape trading actually i don't know if this tape trading anymore we're just kind of a lot closer at this point we're giving each other dubs it's a little different tape trading involves the male and not really meeting someone yeah. in my humble opinion you know and then uh but slug gave me this tape that was sent to him and it was aesop it was his uh first works and then i got in touch with him and met him hung out with him and then signed him to mush which you know fuck mush they like he's got his records back now but yeah. first time he got to put something out so that was all through um loving fucking tapes and i have every single tape in the other room they're all in great condition you i don't know what's on that needs to be in a museum yeah. like that stuff needs to yeah. be in a museum you still gotta like, wait in for listen history to that? like do you got a tape player at the house doesn't still matter pop oh in? dude i got a tape player in every room Hell i got yeah. a kanye Jesus. i got the ll cool j radio when, yeah. with my video game money the first thing i did was i was like i want all the ghetto blasters i couldn't get when i was fucking nice. 12 yeah yeah anyway so lots of tape players i actually listen to a lot of shit on tape i got a, my rap collection is a little broader I have a lot, but, you know, like all my Lord Finesse and fucking uh, a lot of my early East Coast shit is all on tape. That's uh, dope. So that's I kind of hard. You got cool G rap. rap. That's cool. That's so good. You mentioned, uh, you know, a couple Anti-Con guys, Alias, um, right. which I have an Alias shirt on tonight. All right. There you go. Yeah. Ah, yes. Right. Bless, man. One of I my miss him every day. One of my favorites. How did, how did the conversation for creating Anticon, you know, as a collective even come about, you know, and when did that come And then about? how did you guys make your way to Berkeley? Because us being Northern California kids. Well, San that, Francisco, Berkeley, yeah. That yeah. was like. Okay, you guys are. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're in like the Stockton area. So like we found yeah. Anticon and that was the first time I heard like I felt like, oh my God, there's this other subgenre of hip hop that. Is, is unfound for me it was unfound i got like i got to show everybody this yeah, everyone like, needs a, a, niche, uh, a niche hey now. thank you yeah. you, know First what I mean? off, you know i think that's i think one of the things that's happened to our music at, at least for me i speak for myself here is it's like remained something that became personal to people and therefore was like a secret so there's this mm-hmm. interesting slower spread of the work but better people and it's taken in a real space so i'm appreciative but it's this thing that i walk with you know so 
when Anacon started, and also uh, with Anacon, all this is subjective. I don't remember so good. I've been on drugs my whole life. Okay. And, uh, you know, everybody, it was all, it was so many human beings. Everyone's perspective and take on it is super valid, you know. Uh, but the it started right after we all met, tape trading. Um, I think the bond was closest between Soul and I. I think Dibs told Soul, Dose is going to call you immediately and be fucking annoying and want to do music right away. And then <laughs> Which Big Soul awesome. told me that the second I talked to him. <laughs> Which is true, right? And that's what yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I was like, yeah, let's do a song. So uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we just, you know, we started bonding. That's how Jeff and I were rolling. Uh, Buck, 65, all these dudes. And we all just were connected and more than anything wanted to start a label. And then we took Greyhound buses out and made Deep Puddle. Um, and Slug already had rhymes here, so it wasn't really about who's in, who's out, what the fuck it was. But after that, we decided that we wanted a home to put things out, and that felt really good to me because when I did Hemispheres, and Soul had the same thing with his first vinyl, you could go to Fat Beats or TRC, right? Fat Beats was all East Coast. They actually, uh, Eclipse was just straight ghosting me. Everybody was like, nah, not even, you know? Uh, and then TRC, uh, they called me up and they said, hey, this isn't hip hop. It's fucking hemispheres, bro. Yeah. That's what they told me. They didn't take the record. Then this dude who wears raver pants, Charles. I'm sorry, Charles. I, I think that's your fucking name. Raver I apologize. Pants. I don't remember. Hey, shit. Chuck, uh, be, sorry, Chuck. We forgot your name. Shout out yeah, Chuck. Chuck. Chuck of the raver pants. But he... Uh, he put it on. Yeah. He gave us a P and D. He took the hemispheres. He took the thousand. They went super fast. That was all there ever was. So that became this thing where Soul and I were both trying our best to do business. Then um, uh, Soul and Pedestrian were together in California. Yoni and I were still in Cincinnati. Jeff still in Chicago. And they called me one night on this ugly green phone we had in the Green Think Mansion. And uh, they were like, we got this name. Anticon. We were like, all right. That's right. You know, it just felt right. And then uh the plans, we did a couple trips out to California to record stuffed animals and shit. Um and just be loose while Soul Soul gets all the credit for founding. I mean, Sue was meager, but he did it. You know, he got this it was a three bedroom apartment with eleven human beings in it. Wow. It was fucking wow. nasty. Yeah, including Bren and his wife Jen. It was a lot. So uh and then we all went out there in a few waves uh, and moved out whenever we got money. You know, like none of us had any money. Uh, we don't really come from it. So we all had to wait for weird shit. Jeff had like a telemarketing job. I got like $800 from Mush. Uh, you know, it was fucking, wow. we had nothing. And then we all worked temp jobs, lived in this house, recorded all the time. Definitely some of the best times and years of my life. We were a fucking non-stop hip-hop sleepover of absolute stupidity mm. it was pretty it was pretty wild an fun. underground machine you guys were just pumping out a lot of energy project too, after project know. after project yep having a lot of fun meeting all our all the people that inspired us once we were in cali and then you know we came to uh cali that was like executive decision that soul brandon made came to the bay specifically because quantum because souls because legends absolutely they were flourishing there. Why not? We all came from fucked up places. I was in Cincinnati, came from Jersey and Philly. I was like, yeah, let's do it. I got like an odd wallet of carrot juice. I didn't, I thought it was another planet, man. Mm. My first California week, <laughs> but you know, it was great. And it opened it us. We all, we all needed it. Cause we had a lot of uh, walls. We all had been trying to get into music and be in the way we were. And those walls came down rapidly as we got together and huddled around like being creative and, um, I don't know. It was, it was uh, definitely like a soulmate affair, you know. And then we all lived together too long. We all had to get space and get the fuck out of there. That shit was way too much. What, of, what, what happens with your best friends? I've, I've moved out with what? my best friend <laughs> yeah. right away and immediately, like, you know what I mean? We hated each other for a oh, while. Yeah. But you get over it. It's, brother, it's brotherly love, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's too true, you know. And I think that was all a part of it. And you can't uh, – I think, like, the great – we all uh, – could tap into uh, being better faster, mm. uh, graduating our own selves individually, stylistically, artistically, because we were amplifying one another and seeing one another take leaps. And even when you were out of juice or leaps to take, it would just kind of happen, you know, mm. and that was super important. But then the 
what happens because of that is you got to become an individual and you got to focus on where you're going. So it's like, you know, you have that space and you actually learn how to drive your creativity and be the shit to yourself. And then you have to go somewhere with that. And it takes individual questing and shit. Just coming up with your whole rhyme scheme and style, where did that come about? You just, uh, you know what I mean? You, It's kind of, it's, it's fucking it, wicked. It's wicked. Is That's all that I can put on it. So how, how did that even come about? And someone be like, dude, yeah, do that shit. And how did you uh, how did you evolve it from hemispheres to the yeah, style? Yeah, because the hemispheres, it's, yeah, it's exactly. morphed. It's, it's morphed a lot. Yeah, yeah. Hemispheres is a. Uh, I mean, when I started, I sounded like Guru. To uh -huh. be clear, like I was like a little Guru Buckshot Shorty mm -hmm. thing. I don't know what yeah, was going I can on. Hear that. You're spitting hard. Yeah, and I was, you know, I never moved my top lip when I rap. <laughs> that shit it was very East Coast at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then. I'll be honest, man. You know, I heard uh, things. Like, it was all West Coast material for the. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. The Jizza, I wrote one thousand raps because of Liquid Swords. You know, like yeah, yeah. that uh, penmanship was all that shit. That era, that East Coast era, was super revolutionary. But then I heard fucking. It was like the thing that really blew my mind. Besides Fellowship, was Saphir. I fucking heard Boxcar Sessions. I heard him on. Uh, Body Hats, the third digital underground record. Mm. And I was, because they always bring a new dude. And I was like, oh my God, the new Tupac is better than the old Tupac. <laughs> I was like, who is this dude? And uh, he was just killing it, that unorthodox shit, um, which Micah uh, Jupe actually is, uh, Self Jupiter is one of the people who I think is uh, one of the only other people on that tier with Saphir, where you actually can't see what's coming. You know, I think with Micah, uh, you can't either, but he's sticking a melody and a cadence, which locks a groove a lot more. Yeah. And like, you know, he does some more eccentric shit, but like, there's this thing about Sphere and Jupe where you don't know what's happening. And like, I heard that and I was like, ah, oh, I gotta reboot. I gotta have no father to my style. I gotta be unpredictable. And then I heard the Sphere casual battle. And even though that's all majority written, the pencil neck piss color Gumby and fucking Fresh Prince of Bel Air with a slang dictionary. And like, <laughs> I just was like, yeah, that's how I want to talk to people. Yeah. I want to sound like their mother meets the street. And I want to really take away their masculinity. Uh -huh. I want to get them uh, in that vulnerable spot that they wake up in, not the one when they put the backwards hat, you know, like. And so I heard that shit. And then that kind of seeped in. And really it was Saphir. And then it took me a bunch of recording, almost all of Hemispheres and the shit before that, uh, to loosen up and to get out of my own way. Uh, and I just mean recording, like how to get off paper, or get in my head and kill a take and do a better song. Because uh, I've always been someone that even before I was cool on record, you would see me in a cypher and you'd be like, who's yeah. that Puerto Rican dude? You know, and then after that, <laughs> It happened on the other shit, you know, so um, and then just like getting open uh, with a free, I got really addicted to styling on record, preparing it and drilling it in a take and like rolling my eyes back in my head. And because that's not really something you totally do freestyling. Yeah. But really, eventually that shit was like, I man, I still do it. There's parts on the alpha, the new alpha where I just. You know, I just uh, leave Earth for fucking 48 seconds. And it's my favorite shit. On the, everything else is boring. I'll be honest. I do a lot of cool stuff. It's all boring compared to, like, the high of fast rap. You really nailed that that unique sound. I mean, you don't sound like anybody else. And when you no. hear a song, you know right away, oh, that's Dose One. Yeah. There's other rappers yeah. you listen to, especially, especially nowadays, that you hear them and you couldn't tell them apart from you know, and another person, all the auto tune and yeah. everybody sounds the you same. Definitely. And, yeah. and for you to even, you doesn't it. help. No, it <laughs> doesn't help. You, you nailed it too with the uh, self Jupiter too. Like the not being able to guess where he's going, not just with his wordplay, but with the rhythm of what he was saying. Yep. And I could totally see that in your style now too. Like that totally opened my eyes right there. Yeah. And also, um, to be fucking clear, uh, all the times I freestyle with peace as I was around him a bunch in the Bay. I have some very mm -hmm. NSF podcast stories about peace, but he's uh him freestyling is 
the lesson man if you've never freestyled with peace you are not ready he is the only dude except micah where they they finish rapping in the circle and then it's my turn and i'm like oh i rap like <laughs> they take me out of it the yeah, shit is yeah. so good i'm like god damn peace ha- yeah peace has this ability to like um he gets better as he goes right yes and in the like uh field in the mind that is milliseconds between saying one thing and another, he has this like 20 sided die thing where he just rolls what he was talking about all the way across thinking and says something else that is that he makes work uh, because he has a relationship with that shit, man. He has a deep relationship with pulling from the brain into the rhythm and all that shit. And you really, I think that's one of the things I really saw in peace was like, I have a lot of talent with that and I put a lot of work in and I get out of, I try to like go there and I was like, wow, this dude's better. He's like a lot better. He has more talent at it. He like that God of getting open likes him more. It's like his favorite dude. You know what I'm saying? There was just, there was shit where it literally puts me in my place, which is a very good thing. Cause it always pushed me, but like being around that shit. Uh, and then there's like, uh, for, you know, like a lot of underground cats, guys that are probably dead now. There's been a lot of people that have gotten open like that in front of me. Not just those dudes, but they're the ones, man. Micah, too. The second he starts rapping, you're like, wow. Coolest dude in the room. <laughs> Pretty cool. This, this we got to keep cool. it cool. Hell yeah. yeah. Staying, on yeah. The, staying on the topic of freestyling, you know, I've, I've definitely yeah. seen that video or I guess it's a... Uh, it's like a story about you teaching freestyling to you know kids and stuff inner uh, city the kids, youth yeah. yeah inner city kids how did you get involved with that man and you know is that something you're still kind of involved with or you know how long were you doing that for and how'd you get involved with all that it's pretty dope yeah i had a i was dating a amazing lady um who had friends who ran a community outreach program uh which i went to and it was underprivileged kids from the bay and richmond area um and uh it's called ymr youth movement records and then eventually the video you probably saw was when we were located in oakland school of the arts osa downtown we were in some other shitty building for a while but they called me in to speak to the kids mm. and so i go in to talk to the kids and it goes pretty well uh and then at the end they're like hey we got to cut this we got freestyle class and i was like can I stay? <laughs> you know, and then yeah. I just stayed. I met Kev, who was the instructor. And I was just like, you know, I want to do this too. Um, we really didn't add structure. I think the really interesting thing was we just let these kids light themselves up. And uh, you could tell it was the most they liked a classroom experience, period. And they probably were having a hard time with all that shit. So we just kept it super open. Uh, we diffused battles. We also let them battle, uh, you know, like in a more organized way. Um, they said the damnedest shit. Uh, what was my favorite? The dude's line that was my favorite. It was, uh, rappers are confused like they just became parents. Oh. <laughs> Come on, truth. bro. Some I shut truth. the whole cypher down. I was like, that's it. We're done for that day. <laughs> was- this guy gets it. A plus. Yeah, yeah man. Feel hard. <laughs> and, um, you know, so. I did it for several years. I loved it. I brought beat makers in. We would play drums live. I tried to expose them to different music. Yeah. I uh, I showed them This Is The Life. You know, I yeah. showed them uh, Latif, Lyrics Born. I basically, it would be a small bit of exposing them to freestyling that I could get mm-hmm. copies of, evidence of, you know, and then compose stuff. Uh, and they honestly, even though a lot of them were listening to like, I would say the most interesting thing they liked at that time was Lupe Fiasco. Um, they were listening to all kinds of like pre-drill shit. Mm-hmm. These little clips. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really know. A lot of bass shit, Kit, of course, you know. Push. Kit, push. But nobody was styling. And I show them styling, and that fucking cypher, they're styling. Changed oh, yeah. everything, yeah. Changed their lives, probably. They, they didn't, they, and also what I loved is they didn't need two months on the bike, man. The good kids just heard that shit, and they were like, all right. Yeah. And they would just go across the lane, and then it kind of stuck. And they would revolve between like being understood in the current cadence of rap and then yeah. like style, you know, I think it's a pretty awesome way to, for one, give back to the community and then two, give kids or the youth, another outlet to utilize other than whatever fucking around in the streets and this and that, you know, turning yep. something, turning something negative into a positive, man. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, give them some time. I want to do it in Santa Fe. There's like a, this very white 
environment, but uh, <laughs> there is a strong indigenous community and I'm just waiting to find the right connects because uh, I imagine in some way I can help them, whether it's utilizing Ableton or maybe motherfuckers rap, I don't really know, but I would like to get back into it on that level. Um, but for me, I think it's important to plug in in a way that I didn't have it when I was a fucked up kid. I would have loved to have something like that. So I don't really want to do it at like sunny day, Brookshire Academy. Yeah, yeah. To a yeah. bunch of people with saddle shoes. I'm not being weird about it, but yeah, yeah. I actually would. If I'm going to take that time out of my life and do it pro bono, I want to give it to people that like need to find creativity. For sure. You got to do it you right. Got to do it right, man. Um, I also yeah. saw like, like gel was in there, you know, uh, on the beat machine and maybe on the turntables or whatever, uh, busting out some beats. Now you started producing too. How is, is, you know, that stemming from just being with gel and doing a number of albums as themselves together and just being around him and other producers, uh, so often, or, you know, how did you take up producing yourself? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I'm a good mimic mm -hmm. and, um, I'm not scared of, I'm scared of some shit, but I'm not really scared of a lot of uh, creative, you know, avenues. So I just yeah. try it. I do it poorly till I don't. And then I'm very aware mm -hmm. of if I have talent or if I'm wasting my fucking time, you know, like I've tried enough. So anyway, uh, being around gel and then I was not really a producer. I, of course, always use beat machines. I think I struggled mm -hmm. to like trim samples correctly. I don't know what I couldn't get. And then I got in to Dawes. And once I got, uh, once I could see music in a linear fashion, it was more than being a beat maker. I was like, wow, I'm a producer. I just had to spend time knowing nothing so that yeah, I yeah. could know a little. So through Subtle, working with Jordan, the drummer, I was basically the producer along with him, uh, running the sessions, making ideas, doing drops, coming up with ideas for composition and stretching. Then I started using Ableton more, making beats in there. Now I use all kinds of shit and I'm not scared. And I taught myself how to make music because Jeff is self-taught and Dax is self-taught. Mm -hmm. And so that was a huge jump was seeing Dax play keyboards. Yeah, for sure. And he, he's just fucking murdering it. And he, um, it's totally self-taught. Yeah. And so he thought he was, he just let me something about that. Let me learn. Whereas classes, shit like that has never been my bag. And then uh, I just made a million fucking things. Suck. Suck until you don't. <laughs> you, you're even making uh, soundtracks for video games and shit now, right? Yeah, it's my kind of, you know, to be, to not mince words, uh, I feel a lot of musicians from my era, mm -hmm. you either blew up and were modest mouse size, right? And you're still okay. Or uh, you did not. And that's a lot of really brilliant people really generous people, hardworking people that had their value sort of um, abstracted before it was actualized. So uh, I feel like I actually, I was in severe debt and I had to get a gig, which was doing sound design for video games. Mm -hmm. My debt was not from cocaine <laughs> and, and fun. It was from <laughs> just doing music and going hard and being the mom of a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. And then now uh, after a whole fuck ton of, work and a bunch of great relationships and opportunities that came from music. Mm -hmm. So the guys who made Enter the Gungeon, Dodge Roll, they knew they love battle rap. They love idea, rest in peace. And they were like, we love you. And I got a shot to do music for that game and it changed my life. So now I see my value times 10 because I get a small percentage of revenue share um, that I work super hard for because I do about three times the work of an album as well as help write and whatever else. Basically like... It's just this whole thing where I'm like, yo, this endeavor is going to treat me right. Uh -huh. You get full access to yeah. all my shit. Oh, yeah. I'll fucking name it all. I'll, I'll sit in the back and not say shit. I'll do whatever the fuck you want, you know? So that same way that I went at being a avant rap music dude, yeah. I do it here. And it's just like great people, great relationships, no bullshit. Industry's still here. Nothing oh. is streaming it's great you and know the, so and the money comes and also, in on time and the money's amazing man yeah. and you know what i do with it is it be generous and just enjoy that uh i i'm fucking grateful you know mm -hmm. so i uh, just i'm happy about my gig i make a bunch of games and then i'm really good at it so now the big thing too after anticon closing the music industry sucking all the dicks together tied with rope um 
and losing Bren, losing Alias, mm-hmm. uh, right after Les's orchestra, yeah, I was like, horrible time. Yo, yeah, I was just like, I this amazing journey went went dark you know what i mean and i was like uh how do i get back to this thing i love so the big move for me alpha 2 marks like the beginning of a new chapter where it's like the i love making records having best friends truly connecting going the distance pulling something out of the ether making this thing right i fucking hate everything else yeah that was added after that point but i needed to do it to create a career Mm -hmm. to create a cyclical revenue to be out with the homies to blow up to fucking do stuff to meet all these great people like the no twist in germany so like that shit needed to be done but now surgically removing all that career garbage motherfuck your interviews your photo shoots fuck all of that crap just records and anonymity um that's really what I'm about. I, you know, it's like, yeah. I can't, the rest of it is maybe not a waste of everyone's time, but it is truly a waste of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Does that go with playing shows? How do you feel about live performance yeah. and stuff like that? Uh, yeah. You know, it's like, I think, uh, so I was going to do a 13 and God reunion uh-huh. uh, yeah, in Germany you, yeah. because they wanted to do it and they had a festival, but then it got canceled because of funding and bullshit. Yeah. So I said yes to that. Um, things like that. If it feels right to me, I'll get it together for that because that can be beautiful. But I don't ever need to see a fucking Texaco in Omaha again. (laughs) And on a human level, I totally, you know, I understand that so much because you can only do so much for so long on the road and not have the return, the... What do they say? The juice be worth the diminishing squeeze. returns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, no, it's and you know the other thing too is like uh, I really when I go out and do something live, I like to be fucking blisteringly tight and know that I'm killing it and doing something good. Mm-hmm. And now I like making music all the time and doing all these games. My days are like full of um, pushing myself to bring something out of the ether. Mm-hmm. I don't want to cut that off for six days in a car going to fucking Toronto. God bless Toronto. I don't yeah, believe God, you're to Toronto. amazing Toronto, but I don't want to go. <laughs> so I, as period. a fan, as a fan, it breaks my heart because we don't, we want to see we you live see you, yeah. as a fan, but as a, I'll do some stuff, as you a, know, but just make sure you go. If I say I'm doing it, yeah. just know between us, Especially, so, you don't want to be there, and you're you're, you're like, you're who the fuck this? is? This? Yeah, like, why am I here? No, yeah, we. Yeah, but okay. I, as a human, I totally fucking agree with you. I I could see that, and at, at my age, I'm you know I'm in my mid thirties, and I would not want to be out on the fucking road right now. No, fuck, you no. know what I mean. And there's a uh, like a hard truth that I used to say back when I was touring hmm. uh, that still is with me, and not in like a bitter, funky way, but just the reality is i used to say sometimes that we would go on tour and we weren't seen we were missed Mm -hmm. because we had half cap in all these places Mm -hmm. and jj gel and i and all the other beautiful human beings i toured with yo we did an absolute decade three to four tours a year we went everywhere Mm -hmm. and we were missed in half of those venues smd.com I'll catch you later. I'm sorry. Y'all got a time travel. I don't know what to say. We were out there. We did it. That effort for me, but I'm not like, um, something about that is just as true to me that we were missed. And that's an important uh, way to look at it as is, yeah, I don't feel like going to Texaco. Yeah. One, one of my favorite uh, live performance moments by you what wasn't even at one of your shows. It was at an Idea and Ability shows. Uh, one of the last, they were promoting uh, Bite the Throat at Bottom of the Hill in San Francisco. You were in the crowd, and like at the end of the show, Idea just calls you up on the stage. And I'm pretty sure you two are just freestyling back and forth. It was just fucking awesome, bro. Like that's, That was a rare moment that, you know. Hip-hop history. history right yeah, there. hip-hop history to, yeah. be, to be there and witness. That's my guy. I mean, like, you know, sl- um, you know, rest in peace. I can't speak for Mikey, but yeah. I know um, I love Max very much, too, uh, abilities. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the energy I was bringing to rap, which I was gathering from all the people I was meeting in rap, I didn't invent shit. I just was, like, stealing what was fucking new to me and amazing and that I could steal. What and, everyone uh, else is doing as well. When I met. Yeah. Say, say what, what, what else? What everyone else was doing as well, was, you know. You're yeah, yeah. A bunch Sponging of is yeah. the nice way. Stealing is hard, you know, harsh uh, term. But 
I met Mikey and he was fucking 16 and he was amazing. Uh, off top, break dancing, doing everything at once. And he got a lot. Uh, my glow amplified his and he just took that and rolled with it. And I didn't see him as much as I like. We got to do a few things. Um, but yeah. And then we got to connect again way later, uh, right before he passed. We did a whole tour together and it was really beautiful. Him and Max and me and Jeff are motherfucking peas, different peas and different pods. And uh, yeah, man. And also, he's one of the few uh, that can really get open, like yeah. freestyle, Most gifted, definitely. did the did the work and the gift times a million. You know, for sure. A, a, a performer, genius, a genius. performer, yeah, artist, poet, poet, yeah, yeah for sure. M yep. Much like yeah. yourself, exactly. Why you guys probably gelled so well? Yeah, definitely. No Be before we it, jump yeah. into uh, you know your newest projects with Alpha, uh, your newest uh, group. Um, let's just talk a little bit about some more hip hop history real quick. You're a man that's yep. been involved with many different groups, bro. 13 and God, Subtle, Themselves, Deep Puddle, Deep Puddle Dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. I'm forgetting so many. What, what was the energy like in that room? Uh, and how long did it take to make, you know, uh, the taste, a taste of rain, why kneel with Deep Puddle Dynamics? You know, how long did it take to record that? And then Classic, what, what was yeah. the energy like, man? Cause that's, that's a straight hip hop history right there. Uh, so, okay, this is another one where I'm going to say some words, mm. but if you read numbers that are different, those are right. Mm. I don't really remember exactly how yeah, long okay. we were there and all this shit, but uh, we all took Greyhound buses out. We met, yeah. we had all these electric phone calls. I think we did, uh, whatever it was called, three-way? We did fucking three-way phone call yeah, yeah, back yeah, in the yeah, day, yeah, yeah, proto yeah. phone over oh, the yeah. internet. Yeah. Yeah. We were like, let's do these songs about <laughs> these things, and I was probably the dick that said most of the, like, inaccessible things like we're a candle and that are uh, uh and so but it was great man because i sorry uh that's a terrible way to describe what we were trying to do i think it, what was valid is we were trying to do a concept record without um being avoiding all the like cliche violent terms you know uh which at that time we were sort of just after the versace era like the junior mafia mm -hmm. Boot camp, click. Boot camp was great. But, you know, just like bullshit, guns, clothing it was getting really shitty. So we wanted to do something where none of that was in it, but it was all conceptual. We kind of stuck with it, made it cool. And we didn't say our name. It wasn't like, I'm slug and yeah, I'm yeah. toast. None okay. of this crap. So that was really it. So we came up with a bunch of topics that we met in Minneapolis. Had like one of the best experiences of my life. We had all really hadn't met. We met at a show before on the way. We fucking slept on floors in Slug's house. I met Abuse. I don't know if you abuse, know Abuse. He's an insane artist. He did the Anticon Ant. Um, and he was an, an another tape trader who had like a bunch of shit I actually didn't have. Like at the time, I guess I never had Eli's As They Pass, I think was the oh, first one. Yeah. Uh, and so he gave me that and a bunch of soul shit I didn't have, even though I was there on a trip with soul. I was like, <laughs> oh, I don't have those five songs. So we were just like... Mm. <laughs> Still trading, staying up all night, um, writing raps, meeting for the first time. I think it was about two weeks. It couldn't have been more. Um, and then we did some separate sessions later. The last four songs were done a little more piecemeal, uh, piecemeal after. Yeah. So, but yeah, man, me and uh, uh, Bren wrote our verses for the make it rain song that's like on the 12 inch or whatever yeah on slug's porch on this rainy day mm. and it was great and bren came out of his uh shell in that experience mm -hmm. i wouldn't know because i just met him you know what i mean i just met like new bren you know and uh everybody was it was amazing man it was a real highlight of life uh and then we all went back to our shitty places we lived mm -hmm. and like listen listen to the dubs and the mixes. And then when we finished that record, we were like, we gotta start a label. This is important. Yeah. Collect so. collectively, man, you guys together. Beautiful music. Um, yeah, and some know. would say, I mean, that even kickstarts the, the slug epitome, to go to Rhyme yeah, Sayers for sure. and create a Rhyme Sayers label, right? Well, no, they were already okay. so Rhyme Sayers had already existed. They okay. did overcast and really everything, you know, I'll be clear, like they had an amazing community. Mm. Probably the most developed I had ever seen, and Cincinnati's was pretty good. Mm. Out east, my experience was never the word community. 
that's a Midwest thing mm-hmm. yeah. where like there's like a bunch of different color and kind of people together making hip hop because they really want it in their place. You know what I'm saying? In the city, in the cities where I grew up, it was fucking doggy dog. Competitive. Uh, yeah. I don't know about the word community crew. Maybe you can get one C word, but you're not going to get community. <laughs> and uh, so, but he really had that. Uh, Rhyme Sayers was like this from fucking jump street, man. I went out there. I met everybody, you know, uh, Musab and uh, Sadiq, of course. And, bird and like everybody was there and helping each other everything was in sadiq's house wow. i don't think he does that anymore crazy. No, i don't think he's probably i think not. he's balling now i don't um, think he lets you record sleep in his living room yeah, yeah, yeah. i think he stepped up a little bit uh since then yep. um so let's just jump into the new project man alpha uh y- your new crew or group with uh, mestizos you and mestizo you guys released a you know your first uh album self-titled album in 2017 i want to say um, yep. Super dope. Since then, you guys have released the second project. I think it's just called, it's just Title Two, and uh, yep. that was released in November. Let's talk a little bit about that, man. How did this, uh, you know, project come about, and how did Alpha form? Because, dude, it's so refreshing to know and to hear you still making music, man. For one, you know, two, how ha- have this, have this beautiful creativity come about. So, uh, Zoe and I met when he was like 16 and I think his rap name was Yoda and he was in an MC battle. I think it was Tucson. Again, if you see other words or numbers, that's what's right. Not me. Yeah. And, uh, and so yeah. Jell and I did a themselves show there when Jeff used to put the SP 1200 in a duffel bag with no padding and take it places before we did anything really. And, uh, to the show and then he was in the battle and uh, his energy was great and we were freestyling and then a million years later i met him as mestizo in machina muerte you know and uh he was rapping all the time in la um and i didn't really know but then we reconnected and then i heard his music around that time you know i just re-saw him and remembered him mm-hmm. but it's not like he played me all his music in that instance so and then i was like This dude is nasty. And then over time, even though we're very different people, uh, we are the same shark. Uh, And we are. That's why it's alpha. It's just this thing that even though I got cats and he's got kids, (laughs) fucking sharks. And we let each other do that. We have each other's back. There is something that I did not have in Anticon. In Anticon, I was the only battler. So there was a lot of bullshit with like some of the other contemporary crews calling us, you know, the, the F word and like. But never to my face, you know, it was like everybody picked their battles, you know, yeah. and meeting someone like Mestizo, we really have that in common. It's like creative, sure, but guard dog, you know, and so we just kind of fucking let that out. We get each other's back. We're in a new space. We can actually be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Violently vulnerable is what I feel is the best thing about the best parts of Alpha 2. It's not like old man in a chair rap, but it's distinctly no. like hitting you, drilling you in the heart, yeah. uh, and it's some real shit, you know. And I and we do it like, like it's bars, you yeah. know. But the, we just have a really good connection. All we do is do a verse. The other dude hears it and does another verse. And then with this record, uh, one of the struggles was on the first record we went through producers just trying to find the right person, and at the end we found, of course, Bren alias, and then he passed away. And I actually have a bunch of beats that were supposed to be for the second alpha that wow. was staying in the iTunes forever, you know. Yeah. But so that we waited, that happened to coincide with me just processing his passing and being in that, you know, about all the other shit. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we mediocre is like. Mestizo's gel. So uh-huh. his best friend for a long time, his right hand man made all his beats on an SP twelve hundred, and Meaty just came with a fucking ton of heat. And uh-huh. JJ and I are a nightmare, dude. <laughs> JJ and I hadn't spoke for eighteen months, and then this email starts with ten beats, and we made the record in six weeks. Jeez. Wow, you know? fast. That's when you know you're. Of course, yeah, you're, you're rolling. Yeah, it gets assembled and yeah, mixed yeah, after that, but like flowing. the. Uh, the tag of both of us like it started with like i was super busy and i'm like yo i can't be fucking sitting here rapping all day and this mm-hmm. shit you know and then next thing i know i'm just behind on work and all i'm doing is fucking rapping every morning at 6 a.m it was great you got extra bars you got tons of lyric and content you're like hey, we need to make another album yes yeah, so we're working on three now we got an amazing posse cut 
and a new song that's like a long song that we're putting out and a video in the next couple months here and then we're gonna start working on this three and then uh that's it man we just fucking trifecta out or die yeah and we're super good to each other we don't have shitty expectations about stuff we just approach this music that shit i was expressing earlier about me wanting to just do music and move yeah um they're good with that and uh, that's what i need you know what i'm saying yeah yeah so I heard uh, in like another interview, you said you took the uh, the money out of the equation. It's just now about making the music, you know. So you're not afraid I, to do diff- whatever, put out different. Yeah, and I also, I, you know, I'm like uh, I fucking ran a label, five labels. I don't know. So like making it, uh, making it not be negative pennies is really easy. The expectations that like come after that are actually about marketing and business and the world's reception of it. Mm-hmm. And that's where I'm like, Hey, yo homies, I love you. I'll do another record tomorrow. But like, I ain't trying to market, you know, uh, it's a, what I like most about all the music I found is that I found it. This may not be the best business plan mm-hmm. for a, a man of my stature to adopt, but it's, I'm not about a business plan right now. I actually want my music to have that relationship mm-hmm. to people to be a bunch of shit you can dig up for a while yeah for sure and that and that mindset i guess uh, is in history a true artist mindset and you are somebody that dabbles in a lot more than just music art you are you know i've seen you an painting. you do graphic you've done a lot of your your cover art you've done cover art for some other artists like gel too uh talk a little bit about how you got into painting and doing your cover art and because that's always a, I always love that about a rapper or an MC somebody that does the music the beat the cover art you know what I mean multi the yeah, whole project sure. is his yeah, multi hats uh, tell me a little bit about how you got into that because I love that part and obviously that's the artistic mind that you have that 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 mindset of you know sometimes you're gonna lose a penny by not doing what's culturally right but you're gonna do what's right for yourself yeah and I think that so that all that jazz starts from being like slightly visually adept from tagging and having black mm-hmm. books. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was doing that for a million years. So I don't know, space letters or something. And then, uh, and I would spray paint and, you know, pick colors and shit. But then the real cement was meeting two artists, I guess three. Why uh, was before he really rapped and made music, he uh-huh. painted all the time and did all this shit and we lived together. And he was just like, it was just a comfortability with being creative that like I came the only creativity we had, we had violence and we had creativity and it was all hip hop. And when you were doing that creativity, you didn't like slunch your body or do weird shit or like really be yourself. It was always guarded, lots of posturing being around. Why man, he was just an artist painting. And I, I started to loosen up. I saw what he did. Then this dude five, uh, he used to go by drain. who was a scribble jam graffiti writer is probably my favorite of all time. He was just fucking mind blowing, doing bombing. I've never seen painting faces on telephone poles. And then Adnostam, who was the producer before he was really the producer for Cloud Dead and doing all his own shit. I mean, he was making beats on his uh, SP202, but he was painting and drawing. And he was fucking brazenly like into it. Uh, and he would just do it and he would just paint in front of me. Uh, inspired like the 71 painting and shit that's one of the covers still on my wall over here wow. but uh i just saw that and i was like i want to do it and then he was the one too that was he did music and he did the art for it um and then yoni started doing that and then i was like i want to do that i want to spend time as i finish a record i start looking at the world for what the square is mm-hmm. and the other squares and all that shit and some of my eyes are better than others, but what the fuck you gonna do? Again, self-taught, I don't give a shit. You know, I think it represented things well. Definitely unique in the greater scheme of hip hop at the time and music in general. Um, Cause I was a fan after working at Amoeba of cover art and art in general. So I sort of stopped thinking about my rap record mm-hmm. and started thinking about my record in the store, you know? Yeah. So. One thing I've always been intrigued by is all the different anti-con, the old school like album covers, you know? and just the different weird little paintings or drawings that they had on the on the fronts of them. Always yeah, super, there was a, super artistic. Yeah, like a lot of doodling, yada, a lot of yoni shit. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it was cool. And then I think, honestly, the thing that I saw in Anacon uh, all the way up until its end with artists like Bats or Young Fathers or The More Shallows or, you know, Serengeti, of course, is yeah. that it wasn't about rap. It was about bedroom music. Mm-hmm. We gave people a chance who made bedroom music, you know, and it wasn't this big thing until it was, you know, and a lot of people had to go to great lengths to, like, be dope in the bedroom. And we those people found us, we found them, we put their music out where we could. Um, and I think that was really what Anacon was to me, was a thing that the only barriers to entry were like being unique in yourself and something that impressed us, you know. And we had to grow to allow more people to be received by us. This all sounds very hippie the way I'm talking right now, but we literally did. Like at first we just loved rap. I worked at Amoeba. I showed everybody Boards of Canada. We started growing from there. You only liked some good music, but like Lamb Chop. But I didn't. I'm not going to listen to that shit. You know, so. Yeah. um, So it's interesting, you know, and we just grew. Everybody grew their tastes, opened to more shit, started receiving things. Some things a hit and blended with our existing audience. Some things not so much. Uh, And, you know, I think it was like. Is definitely something I'm glad I was a part of was giving voice to people's voice. It is also something I will not do again. <laughs> yeah, you've made your mark, and we're very happy that you did. Uh, you definitely, someone that we looked up to, like we said, when we were younger, and uh, it was definitely when we heard, when I personally heard that music, I realized that this is, you know, like something that you could be a part of. It felt like a community. It mm-hmm. felt you know, it felt different. It was just different. That's great to hear. I mean? Yeah. And so, did you guys go to Rico shows? Did you make it to any Rico's loft shows? No, we did not. I did no. not. Okay. Those were just great. That was like the very beginning of Anaconda. They uh, were like horrible sound. Yeah. The we best, did a, we did a cover best. night. When it that sounds like was shit, my, my favorite, favorite night ever. I went to a lot of Anticon shows like in San Francisco, bottom of the hill, just small, small little joints, bro. Like, you know, that's the era. That's the era right after, you know, and that was also great shows. Mm-hmm. And I think we were, uh, you got better performances. I'll yeah. say that, uh-huh. but you didn't get the ground. You know, floor. Rico's. It was we would like do a new routine every night, all of us, yeah. and then we would bring up people from LA, various Blowed members and other people. And then one time we did cover night, and we all did covers, and sold it all of. Uh, it's not don't curse, but he did a posse cut heel. You know the posse cut heel with oh. Queen Latifah and Miss Melody. And I don't think so. Has has oh. like twelve rappers. It's like a self destruction predecessor. Okay. Came after that. Right. It's about healing. Has Karis one okay. and so did everyone's verse. Uh, and Damn. but he only knew the lyrics for like two. <laughs> and it was just the funniest <laughs> shit. I did funny. fucking. I did um. Rampage. Uh, by EPMD with Kirby Dominant, yes. and I had to be both members of EPMD, and he was just LL, and he fucking blanked on LL's verse, so I had to be LL too. Oh yeah. no! It was just the best night, man. It was yeah, sloppy. Yeah. A Wall did a fucking what did A Wall? Oh man, he killed it. It was so good. Circus was there. Out of the box the... shit, man. Out of the box shit. I remember a pedestrian was dressed up as like a, a priest or whatever, and you just like fucking yes. going over the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, that was a time. Brandon was on one. He so before that pedestrian would freestyle they did this thing babylonians where they were just freestyle and he was white folks and he would just serve you in the car you'd like go piss in his apartment and he'd push the door open and start serving you he was like that that like being that character became evangelist jb best Mm -hmm. but it was he was merciless man and it was so funny like I battled well, but I would just let him serve me because I would cry laugh because yeah. he was so good at this yeah. lost break it. East Coast uh, white um, Craig Mack. I don't know. He was like old, dirty meets Craig. I don't know what this character was, but it was yeah. something to, to get served by. We, we have a buddy. Uh, we used to smoke weed, and we'd be like, hey, he would he would mimic the pedestrian, you know, and we'd be like, hey, do the pedestrian, <laughs> do the pedestrian, and he would start doing it, you know, so we just start <laughs> busting <laughs> up, bro. Yeah, it was just awesome, you know. Uh, that's as, as that's we, so great. As we wind down here, man, um, what are you listening to these days? Like, you know, what do you find bumping in your car or what's inspiring oh, you? Yeah. Oh, so, I mean, right now the CD in the car is uh, – Ultra, big time, Cool Keith and Tim Dog. Rest in peace, Tim Dog. My favorite, yeah. the heart of hip hop. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. You never die. Uh, and then uh, 
I listened to this year, Buck 65, King of Drums, was mm. fucking phenomenal. Um, I love Billy Woods and Elucid. Yeah, all the nice. shit that they do, uh, pretty much. I mean, you know, it goes without everybody does. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a joiner. I'm appreciator. You know, like all that backwood shit is yeah. like done right. Prem Rock and everyone and Curly, who I met briefly with a Logic at a show in the Bay, and I never would have got to meet them. You know, uh, they're all the real deal. Mm. They're like cut from the cloth, doing it their way. Uh, deeply appreciative. I love Ka, um, but that's been a while now. Uh, and I knew him from Natural Elements, but the uh, new cause where it's at. Uh, what else? Rap wise, uh, Fat Boy Sharif is great. I listen to uh, you know, Jid is kind of fucking amazing. Yeah. I can't hate. Yeah, he's- That's probably the shiniest, popest. He's not that pop, but that there's a lot of shit that. I listen to him and I'm like, oh, this motherfucker is nasty. You know? <laughs> what do you think? And of, then, uh, what, do you think oh, of, what do you think of Kendrick Lamar? A lot of people are, uh, oh. you know, saying that he's like the, the top guy of his generation and the, the new Tupac kind of deal. Yeah. Kind of, sorry, yeah. Oh, Tupac. What, <laughs> the new Micah Nine? I don't know. He's not. Uh, Tupac is garbage. He's definitely, he definitely is the guy of his generation, though. Um, I actually didn't. So when I started uh, styling, making cool music, there are other people that are doing it, namely like Latif, Lyrics Born, Gift the Gab, yeah. uh, the little guys, you know, um, Company Flow at the time, all these guys, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, I really actually, I didn't think that mainstream stalwarts would ever possess or be allowed to wield that kind of ownership and creativity at a maximal level and do what they fuck they want. Mm -hmm. And as a result, be unpredictably impressive and dope. Um, And like, I write off pop rap is just like, it's like country. I'm a horrible person. If you put on country around me, I start freestyling over it and like, whatever. You're your friend. I do the same thing (laughs) with rap. I can't handle it. It's too predictable. Yeah. Kendrick is not. Kendrick's amazing. Um, I love it. I think he's a fucking win, man, for the greatest scheme of rap. I cannot say that about everything that is immensely popular. Kendrick is like someone where you would be like, oh, did this guy listen to Soul Sides and Anticon? Mm-hmm. And and the answer is no. <laughs> but he's amazing. Yeah. And he might as well have. But it's like the kids that I showed Latif. And then that afternoon, they're fucking styling. Um, yeah. It's a uh, something that he tapped into, you know, and I think it's great because he's like around shit like the game, you know. Uh-huh. And he'll, he'll beat me, he'll choke slam me. But <laughs> that shit is, is remedial. It's remedial. It's you know, it's yeah. like it's yeah. what it is. It's yeah. almost yeah. like Kendrick was at the good life at some point. You know what I mean? Like he could have been in that in that house and probably held his own fucking. You know what I mean? They wouldn't. Have I think it's him a, past the mic. Yeah, and it, it's important to remember that. Um, Every once in a while, you can just come out of the void and be as dope as the best that ever were. And if you have the right support around you and you can get recognized, it's a good thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It makes me think about all of the post Micah Micahs that there are that nobody knew about mm. that got shot or dropped or are a mechanic now. Yeah. Because not everybody got Kendrick's twists, you know what I'm saying? Or mine, you know? So it's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm fucking down for that. I wish more shit was like that. That's why I love Jid. Cause I'm like, oh, this is fucking amazing. Something about, yeah, just like I don't know where that's coming from. I guess it's, sadly it's Eminem, but whatever it is, they're getting this chop thing, and they're yeah. like, let's do it. Yeah. They do it their own way. It, there's not much mainstream music I can stomach, but I can, I can uh, you know, Kendrick Lamar is definitely yeah. better than most. Yeah, you, the, you, the lose me, you lose me. You lose me when you talk Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, I'm but... just not a fan <laughs> of that at all. Oh, yeah. what all. do you say? What do you, what do you not like? There's there's I always I don't, one I, don't, of... I don't like that he's trying to be so righteous and. So like, oh, I don't know. and so into, the, that. In, into his people. And like I say, when I, when I say he's more of like a Tupac, he's trying to make a movement out of nothing. And I feel like he doesn't have a mm. lot to say for what he's been through. I don't know. I just don't see him as someone who's an underground hip hop artist or mm. not even that. I but, don't know. But not, not that at all. But I mean, I just know. doesn't have, I don't know, that, that sense of. Hey, man, good luck. So, shots fired. Yeah, shots fired. Hey, shots, there shots goes, fired. Shots fired. There goes our chance of ever getting Kendrick on yeah. this fucking yeah. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Of course, I mean, you know, I think it's relative. Um, I do think that, like, um, success is not – I'll just say this to what you said. 
success is absolutely on the top 10 list of things I don't respect. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you can have it. It can ruin you. If you have it and it doesn't ruin you, that's the only positive effect of success on a creative wow. is that they have it and they're not walking with it like you owe them for it or you don't they don't need to explain themselves to you. It'll change you, though. Creative. It'll definitely change yeah. you. Like, uh, you know, people we know, artists we know, it changes them when they yeah. get super successful. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then it goes away too, which is fun because you get this. You know, it's a it's a moon phase. I'll say that much. Mm -hmm. Comes you know? comes in waves. Well, something that doesn't come in wave mm -hmm. is your constant and your uh, longevity in the hip hop game. And we really yeah, thank you yeah. for everything you've done for the culture and for underground hip hop and for you know everybody out here. And uh, we continue to support you and can't wait to hear some new music from you. And thank you so much for all your time tonight. We. Uh, you know, you very generous with your time on a Friday night. Didn't have to do that for us. And we thank you very Pleasure, much. For that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for appreciating it. Thank you for wearing the alias shirt. Thank yep. you guys for being grounded and like yeah. uh, being someone I could talk to about this shit. For so sure. Means a lot. Yeah, keep we on, would, keep we, it on. We would love to talk to you again about this sometime. Talk talk some more on the podcast sometime. In the Whatever. Future. Holler at your boy. We definitely will. We look forward to hearing more from you. Everybody give it up for Dose One. Hell Thank yeah. you, brother. Hey, don't stop making music anytime soon. Love the Freestyle Fellowship uh, shirt, bro. Yep. Yeah, this so sweatshirt is off the hook. With the hoodie. Let's go. All right, All right, bro. All right guys. Have a good rest Have of your night, night, brother. Thank you for having me. Hell yeah. Peace, man. Peace. Peace, y'all. <laughs>